Yeah, welcome to our kickoff meeting for Neptune. Um, you want to tell everybody a little bit about what Neptune is, Leonard? Okay. Um, ne Neptune was more or less conceived as, um, how was it conceived? So with, with Pluto, you know, I, I think everybody and their brother probably has had one of these things. It's an awesome board. I, I really like it. And then um, Xilinx at the time, now AMD, um, said, oh, hey, we're going to come up with these uh, low cost ultra scale plus version devices. And um, it took me a, quite a long time to get some pricing out of them it, 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 on, on, on those devices. And, um, and it turns out that they weren't really as low cost as I had wished, but it, I suppose they are kind of um, somewhat cost effective comparative speaking and i said hey wouldn't it be nice to make a a, a follow-on similar board to um to um one second uh to pluto uh but using these new ultra scale you know uh plus devices and um you, you know because pluto is getting a little bit long on tooth you know i I really did like the Series 7 devices from Xilinx, but now most people are using either UltraScale or UltraScale Plus or, you know, even the Versal parts. So that was the, kind of the original concept. But um, the reason why we wanted a, a newer platform was because um, uh, my alter ego wanted to, you know, say, hey, we were fighting against China's domination on uh, first person viewer FPV drone technology, which, which, you know, they, they are just dominating DJI is dominating and, and dr drone stuff. So um, one of the first steps to that was, Hey, uh, everything is closed and uh, nobody can interoperate with anybody else. So how about let's come up with a open spec, potentially open source, um, uh, version of these things now there 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 is like Ardu pilot and all that there's kind of open source controls and stuff like that for drones and stuff like that but this was for the video link and mainly for use with fpv drone racing and the requirement for that was you know like 40 megabit type transmission rates and low latency so uh i set a path on finding out well, what can we do um, and what is required to do that? And there was a lot of people that has have dissected the waveforms and the radio um, communications between the drones, the DJI specifically drones and the controller and the um, and the also the headsets. Um, so I looked into that. There's some Python modules and all that. So we started figuring out. Uh, I got in a, with a group of guys from uh, Estonia and Italy, and uh, we started scheming on, okay, how do we do that? How do we meet cost targets and stuff like that to be able to compete in that market? And it, it, it turns out to be really hard. Um, but they kind of have come up with a, a more or less uh, – hardware solution to be able to get into more or less that price range, which is kind of insane. Uh, and then I, I, uh, I had purchased this book from Andreas. Um, for, uh, how do you say his last name, Michelle? Andreas. Uh, I think it's, uh, Schwart I'd say it's Schwarzinger. Schwarzinger. Yeah. So, um, and I reached out to him and he was very enthusiastic about this. And, and he had, uh, you know, since then come out with a second edition of his book. I have both versions of the books in hard copy. And, um, and then now he's coming out with a third edition. And this time he's, I, I believe he's going to sell it with, um, in PDF form, but with a uh, watermark on whoever buys it. So, Hopefully, I'll reduce the you know kind of the rip off. These things are really cheap, and it 
and he doesn't really get very much money from it anyway. So I am very happy to donate whatever it takes to get him involved with this. So he's been, um, he's traditionally a Matt lab type person so most of the code that is available in his books is in matlab and the books uh uh have a lot of information on lte and wi-fi and wimax and stuff like that and implementation details and stuff like that these are just that's what he is you know his profession is that he works for Roy and Schwartz and and he's done a lot of work in in the field with that so i employed him to meaning I didn't employ him like I didn't hire him. Um, I, I asked him to kind of donate some time to help develop the spec. And and he's actually took the ball and ran with it. And he did uh, the spec that's available today for FlexLink um, is nearly 100% his. Um, I started it, but then he took it over and really kind of made it his. And, um, and then the other guys of... Um, Jonas and David um, also kind of helped contribute to some of the stuff that went in there. And um, right now, uh, there's uh, the group is splintered a little bit. Uh, David has actually come up with um, a hardware platform, this low cost hardware platform using NXP processors and uh, vector processors. He's actually selling those things to for generic. Um, DSP based waveforms. And then uh, the, uh, Jonas is kind of um, doing the same thing, but I think he's using David's hardware, but he's trying to get people to help code up waveforms and stuff like that. He's really kind of waiting for us to more or less finish the specifics on the, let's say, the specification. There's probably some holes there, but I mean, implementation wise, um, you know, the spec is kind of wide open on how you implement it. So that's what, where we're, where we come in is we're going to come up um, with uh, one uh, kind of implementation um, for, at least for the transmitter. And, uh, and it's going to be hardware based, mainly, you know, FPGA hardware accelerated type stuff um, version. And then they're going to do mainly a, a, a a software driven type DSP based implementation of the FlexLink specification. The, what we do, I think, is going to be kind of considered the, the goal and standard. I suppose it really depends on who comes out first, but um, short, uh, Andreas and, and I are still working together. We're, we're in contact and, um, and I've, we, we're generating the models um, and, We've um, so he agrees that you know it's kind of good to move over to you know like a low cost model solution modeling solution which was you know Python based. So we're he we've um, I've taken all his MATLAB code and 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 did a translation of that to Python, um, and then uh, this was prior to Chat GPT, which makes it a lot easier now. Um, I do have a subscription to chat GPT four, by the way. And, um, uh, which, which, you know, obviously last year came out and was all the rage. So he, um, also has, uh, coded some of, uh, new, new stuff, uh, and for the transmitter and he's kind of grouped the source code in a, in a pretty good, um, fashion on, on what needs to happen and then uh so if we look at like the the documentation specifically like the block diagram there are kind of areas that we're uh, creating models with the mod the python models are not complete yet um i have posted them on the or i think i do have more files to post of on there but they're nowhere near um where they need to be and probably a lot of stuff is just not needed. So I'm trying to keep the noise level down. Um, as of last week, Andres and I talked and he had some time. He's he's um, actually on vacationing down in um, South America. And um, and of course, like a good programmer, uh, you know, you 
you you take your computer with you and you do work. <laughs> so anyways, uh, he said that he was going to um, do some cleanup on the files and then um, and uh, um, uh, let, let me know when that stuff is up on the on the site. Um, is he I have a question. Is he is he working still in, in MATLAB or is he is he working on in, in Python for, for this set? So all the code that he's doing currently for this project is in Python. So and he's 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 pretty good at it. He's um a good coder. He's um he he can um I suppose he's not quite the hack that I am, but <laughs> so he says he's probably a little bit more professional. <laughs> I, I just it could stuff to get it working and he he does a lot of you know uh parameter checking when you pass you know parameters and stuff through um to methods and classes and stuff like that so yeah, um, yeah. I, yeah I did I did notice that in the in the repository there's there's a there's a lot more error checking than than what say I do for yeah, um, it's, it's good stuff yeah pr probably more than I've seen before but cool. yeah um so anyways uh let's see here the um the so so that's kind of the 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 intro for for the whole thing. Okay. But um. Uh, Thanks. That's a that you've reminded me of. There's a, a, a big swath, a big sweeping amount of of work and uh, and background for this. Um. Cool. Okay. So I I can I can cut in with a little bit about uh about what folks are doing. Um, T. Locke, uh, an ORI volunteer, he's a graduate student, so his time is is limited, but he has been uh, making steady progress on on the kind of the the implementation end. So so when Leonard speaks about like this implementation on on hardware, um, we have a in Remote Labs West, we have a ZCU 102. It's a, a Xilinx or now AMD, um, FPGA development board, and it has connected to it an ADRV 9002. And this is a RFIC radio card from analog devices. And the 9002 um, is selected by, by Leonard, um, and it's, it's more for mobile, like mobile handsets or mobile devices, low power. Um, and the specs are all, all really nice and, and all line up with the, with the FlexLink spec. Uh, so this is in the lab, ready to go. We've had a number of problems trying to get uh, things on the air because of the live IIO or in industrial input output library that analog devices uh, uses uh, for interfacing to their chips. There, there's a, a ongoing problem that affects everybody with respect to the API of their like internal libraries. But we have gotten past that. So now our stations are working over the air with a particular set of tools, tool chain, and then the works from the processor side. So you can go in Vitus, you can write some live IO commands and you can get the stations working on the air. Uh, so that's the good news. Um, so what t -Lock is doing is is setting himself up on the virtual machines that that run all this hardware. And he's done that and, and gotten an account on Karapi. He's uh, getting familiar with MATLAB, HDL or Hardware Descriptive Language Coder, uh, and has read the FlexLink uh, spec. Uh, that's also available on the repository. I'll put the link in here. Um, he's lear learning Simulink. So he had some very, very basic uh, competence with Simulink. Simulink, he's coming along rapidly. There's some excellent free uh, classes or tools, free tutorials from, from MathWorks, who does MATLAB and Simulink. So he's learning that. And he's decided to go ahead and learn PHDL. So the whole goal of of using like MATLAB and Simulink and the HDL coder toolbox um, is we have we have all these things at an extremely low cost to us from MathWorks. The idea is to to use HDL coder to convert uh, a MATLAB and Simulink model of of Neptune FlexLink to FPGA and get it running on the ZCU one hundred two and then nine thousand two and then publish. Uh, not just the design, but the whole process. So we have two videos published so far on the YouTube about the uh, adventure with HDL Coder and FlexLink. Uh, so so those are out now. The, the first one was just 
setting things up and walking through this, the very simple Simulink model that we have so far. Um, it is, it has uh, some configuration in it from the Neptune spec, but it is not a Simulink model of the Neptune spec yet. That's what TLOC and others are, 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 I'm hoping that they will pitch in and help, help do this. And I'll spend as much time on it as I can. The, the whole, the central block in, in the, in the, in the uh, model right now is an inverse FFT or IFFT. And so what we've done, what we've done is set it up as, as much as we can, we've made a, a device under test, we're targeted with HL, HDL coder, and then we're using the workflow advisor to walk through. So those, that adventure, uh, the basic setting it up, the walking through the different blocks, of the model showing how, how it, how it works so far. That was the first video. Uh, and the second one was was resolving some warnings and some errors and and more setup and and getting all the way up to the point where uh, the data types are now really critical. They have to be fixed point for HDL coder to to continue to work. And so the third video will be about setting up data types in the Simulink model, uh, and then moving on from from there. So that's that's pretty it, it from my end. I'm I'm trying to make it possible for the for people to get competence with MATLAB, Simulink, HDL coder, uh, to understand how to produce human readable, open source, freely, free to use uh, HDL code from this particular toolbox and to, to demonstrate this uh, design over the air in remote labs west. Um, and then, then enable everybody to, to publish as much as they want and can about it. Um, and to get as much professional, personal, academic development uh, out of it as possible. All right, that's it. That's it from my end. I think the last person here is a uh, is Ed. So so Ed, uh, welcome. And uh, is there any questions, comments, or or feedback for us? Um, no, I, I wanted to just touch in to say a happy New Year, and uh, also just to see what was. How this project was going on it was interesting it looked really interesting i haven't i just uh got a new job from jt4 that i'm starting next week or the week after next week because next week's more thinking so i've been kind of prepping for that but i was looking at what was going on here and seeing if there was some way i could this is very much aligned with things i'm doing at work so it was something where if i worked to spent a little time doing stuff on this i could easily argue it would be useful to my boss so um yeah that's one of the, that's yeah. one of the goals for sure is that we would we would really like to to harmonize some of this this uh, the like open source work where we're creating designs and publishing them for for uh for the good forces for the good but also it should help you uh, academically professionally that that that's that's one of our goals with all of these projects at ORI so I uh, just I, from a question point of view, and I was sorry, I was when I was talking, I was trying to think about the question. So, um, so what I'm my big curiosity is so you mentioned like VHDL, you mentioned VHD MATLAB's HDL coder, you mentioned doing like a lot of the waveforms in Python. So is it a goal to like kind of just do one thing and drive it really well, or are we trying to spread this out uh, just because we're using whatever we can get our hands on that might do the job well i have uh i have my my take on this is is that um there's you know coming from from qualcomm they they corrupted me with respect to to doing something that they called systems engineering and so if you you have an implementation like like that you're trying to implement a spec specification in this case it's the flex link spec uh, written by by andreas and and um, you know, and Leonard and all that, and so this is a, a classic sort of specification, uh, which you know, still we're still looking, soliciting review and input, and and it will it will continue to grow. It's the physical layer, so it's a physical OFDM uh, a protocol. The the you, the the mandatory part of the spec is you implement a twenty megahertz signal, uh, but it's an OFDM signal that is that is supposed to be provide a data link between you, know, you and and an aeronautics uh, object like a drone uh, and so it's a you know it's a spec so it has numbers and and thou shalt do this and you, know, you can't do that and so when you have a spec and you're trying to make an implementation it's a really good idea to have a team that's writing 
in simulation land, um, like the Python models to me kind of serve that purpose. And that it, that provides a reference. So you you have, there's the inputs, here's the outputs, here's the timing. And then your, your hardware implementation, usually in, in say like VHDL or Verilog or whatever, that, that that team is separate. Those two parallel efforts, they march forward in time and they check each other. And, you know, for digital communications, this is just a, a method or anything of any complexity that really works really well. So it's both and really um, with, we have to have a, a really good Python model, in my opinion, in order to, to double check, you know, errors and mistakes and, and incompleteness in the, um, in the VHDL. So we are using kind of like, this is MATLAB HDL coder, is a, a conversion tool to go from like simulate model. So it also goes from simulation land uh, to to VHDL. So it, it, there may there may indeed be a lot of hand editing for VHDL later, I don't know. Um, the, what we find out through this project is gonna be fed right back into uh, all of those FPGA open source tools teams um, that are looking to, to, to tackle some of these exact same problems. Um, you know, it's not enough to be able to just write in VHDL or Verilog. I, I think it's pretty clear looking around that the there's not enough people that know how to do that uh, to, to to all spread around and to and to implement a complicated system. The the feeling on the street right now is that you really do need to start from something like Python and co-simulate. Um, so Python co-simulation to through all the way through to HDL is a big deal at MathWorks right now. Um, so these sorts of things are, are things that, that a modern digital communications designer is going to need. And the way that the ways that the tools work or don't, because uh, there are some headaches here um, and and things that are that are frustrating. So if we can clearly communicate all of that to open source tools developers, because we're not we're not we're not a tools development team We're we use whatever we can. Um, and at this time, as of right today, there's no open source alternative for for these chips, for these radio cards, for you know, for the type of stuff that we want to do. If there was, we would use it. And I know there's people that would like to see that happen. We would like to help them. So by gaining the experience in in using these tools to create open source designs, then our goal is to also uh, provide a lot of feedback and and um, you know, ground truth stuff, you know, hard earned wisdom to to anybody that wants to do FPGA tools, open source tools. So I, I hope that kind of answers your very good question because I mean, it's a very good question because it's kind of it, it exposes a whole lot of you know complicated things and and, you, and I think that you're you mentioned do one thing do it well you know pick one pick one methodology and punch through and yeah that's that's good um, so we've picked one one technology that we are going to use we we will be using. MATLAB Simulink HDL coder to create the FPGA designs and go all the way through to the ZCU 102 ADRV 9002 in the lab. But we are going to be checking and publishing simulation models in, in Python all along the way. And as of right now, the Python model is well ahead of the implementation in, in for FPGA. All right, back to you. Um, so no, that's great. Uh, it was... Okay, because I can do both. It was I was just curious because like there's Verilog too, but yeah, like you said, we're just trying. You're trying to move that forward and move that needle so those two are a little closer. I'm assuming with like like Python model and the HDL coder are kind of more in the same place. Can this be implemented on the Al down on the Pluto at all, or is it too big for that? Um, you could probably do it on the Pluto. You know the the um i think it's going to be hard to do both you know the transmitter and the receiver and um and right now um so if we um hold up. if we look at the specification and um i'm bringing that up right now so i'm gonna let's see your share Oh, this is just I hear. Um, no, it should. I, I it, you should be able to share screen. Right. Um. So I'm gonna share the uh, Fluxlink doc. All right. 
So right here, you see the FlexLink uh, documentation. And um, in here, uh, currently, we have this, this, so I've talked to Andreas about this, and, and we, we have the, the FEC um, is an LDPC encoder. Uh, and, and in general, that tends to be very large you know, from a resource perspective. So unless you have uh, an embedded LDPC encoder in the FPGA or something like that, it takes up a lot of resources. So um, the devices uh, are very limited and the device on the Pluto is extremely small. Um, I have talked to um, Andres ab about this where, hey, we don't ne necessarily need you know, the very best encoder that's going to, you know, um, you know, get, get approach the sh Shannon limit and all that. So there's going to be instances where we want to use something else like an RS encoder or, or something that's much, much smaller and easier to implement. And, you know, maybe even some source code examples of how to do it. Um, so um, that's one of the changes we're probably going to make in the specification is have the encoder um, uh, be definable. Um, are we as far as like the lesser? You mentioned Reed Solomon. Are you also looking at Reed Muller? Is Reed Muller also a candidate, or is that if you decide is if you have a reason why you think Reed Solomon would be preferable to Reed Muller? Um, Reed Solomon is fairly, you know, common. It's it's used in a lot of different places. I haven't seen a whole lot of implementation of the Reed Muller stuff. I mean, um, I, I mean, prior to doing that, I'd almost think that some of the Viterbi and you know, kind of turbo codes and stuff like that might might come into play more because those are fairly popular. I I, I don't want to. Let's see here. Uh, yeah. A Reed Solomon standard, so yeah, I, I get it. If, if you need, if you don't want to do LDPC, then, and you're looking at, I'm just thinking like also because like you said, if we can get there, there are places where good enough is good enough, and especially in things like video, where there's just a lot of inherent redundancy in the video stream, you can get by. Sometimes getting it fast, getting it through the pipe faster is worth. You you're willing to sacrifice a few bit a bit a little bit on the bit error rate, right? So let, let's go over the kind of the waveform real quick. Um, we have the document open, and um, and let's let's um, so this this is kind of the waveform described in time, where right over here is the very first thing that happens. Uh, so. Uh, the the waveform itself is not like this continuous waveform. It's kind of a like a, a WiMAX Wi-Fi type waveform where you you send a burst of stuff and then there could be some quietness and then you send another one. Um, the when when you're connected to an FPV drone, though, this is going to be happening all the time. There's very not going to be any like gaps in the between a packet or, or not. Um, so the first thing that happens is you're going to send uh, automatic gain control burst, this AGC burst, and that is nothing more than um, a, a short waveform. He talks about it here. Um, and the, the idea is that you're, you're, you're going to be able to um, gate your your gate your front end gain control at the receiver based on the amplitude of this signal, right? Um, and so when you see that, um, you know you you have kind of like let's say a, a long extinction type time for your gain for you know you so you set your gain up, you try to slave onto that, and then that gets you you know the waveform within the your, your local ADC type window. Then you have a preamble A and a preamble B. 
Um, and the idea is that uh, these two are, are, are different. One is to get you, you know, frequency uh, synchronization, mainly, you know, um, to uh, your local, you know, time base essentially is what, what you're trying to do. And then you have time synchronization within the waveform, within the OFDM waveform. So that's what these two things are. Um, and I, there's a time slot associated with it. He describes it down here somewhere. Uh, is this a sequence that has excellent? Uh, do, do, do. Yeah. Anyways, um, there, there, there's timing associated with it, but they're, you know, like five milliseconds or something. And then you have this, what they call the first reference signal. So now we start getting into uh, the thing the, from here to the end of the waveform is, is your OFDM waveform. And if you've looked at, um, uh, let's say LTE, they have this kind of um, grid structure that, that they, uh refer to and each one of these uh thing this is called the resource grid and uh each one of these elements is called a resource grid element um what does this thing say no, enable editing whatever um no oh, shit <laughs> now i got it <laughs> back to where okay. i was so that was in the uh, resource grid construction maybe um Here we go. yeah so um so the this first um time ofdm time slot right here um it, okay so vertically what we have is 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 a uh, um frequency bins basically so uh and it's abstracted from with using like k is equal to zero to k in this case it happens to be 900 um based on the parameters of the check, check. And this first thing here is essentially your reference signal. And what you'll see is you've got um, a combination of uh, pilot signals, essentially P, P0 and P1, one from each antenna, and then, um, and then information, so the control signal. So you see on this first thing, uh, is that that first uh, time slot is is kind of almost all used up to a great extent by the the pilot signals, and then you have the control signals. That so these control signals are essentially um, let's see here. He's got a chapter on that. So controls information. It's where you kind of um, tell the receiver what the parameters are. Right. So a uh, number of signal fields. So if you need more than one field, you, you can change that to, you know, you know, one, two, three, four symbols. And then uh, the number of antenna ports and the phase reference. But anyways, we're we're. Um, so if we change the the. Um, the FEC and stuff, we're, we'll we'll um, we'll do it kind of in in this area. So um, so let's see here. Use QPS and then number of DC carriers reserved. So it, so this is the control information, but then there's also a the signal field. Um, yeah, I have a question. So in the signal field, basically, is where we have how to decode the receiver. Um, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, it looks like it would be not impossible to do um, like adaptive coding and modulation. You could you could do that, you know, the further it got away, the, the, the more coding it put, but that would, that would mean that the bandwidth or the throughput would be um, kind of in flux. So, I mean, I guess it's the overall assumption that you're delivering the same data stream at all times or or, or would you or, or are we, are we going to be delivering like less of a like less throughput lower bandwidth for for more difficult conditions and um and and my second question is is the encoding scheme was is that switchable on the fly it looks like it's in the signal field 
does that mean that like you can change it in the middle of a session? So um, in theory, you should be able to if you have enough processing power, but um, not. So if you go back to the basic, let's see, your packet construction. Yeah. So this is one packet. So the signal field is right here, right? Um, and you can have, you know, zero, one, two, three, or four of these things, depending on how much information you have in there. But um, it, it is certainly set for um, this packet, you know, so uh, it's expected that basically the receiver is going to um, look at this signal field to say there, you know, in most cases you'll just need a, a one. And if we go down to the signal field, it tells you your encoded block size. Um, and that, that's probably what's going to change the most. And then uh, transport block to be sent. So um, basically that determines, uh, let's go to the, so you have a payload field here and each one of these things have got a time slot associated with it. So the length of this payload A and payload B is determined by the that, that um, number of transfer blocks for payload A and then number of transfer blocks for payload B. And each one of these can have payload A and payload B um, can have a different encoding mechanism. Most of the time, like if you're if you got like just one channel, let's say video, you will not use payload B. So um, you know, basically here value zero indicates that payload B is not transmitted. So in the case of uh, you're only using payload A, you know, you you have these values here, and then you know you you now with this information you can uh, decode. Um, you, you know, whatever is in that first section of what payload A. So it, it tells you the FEC use, encoded block size, uh, rate matching transmission, the constellation. So um, is this so what, what I was talking about earlier about the FEC, all this is uh, dealing with LDPC, but if we expand it to include something else, we'll probably add a field here to, um, to say, hey, um, you know, the FEC used is this, and then the encoding rate is, is this other thing. So, um, so the, this value, these, these values here um, are transmitted in that very first, um, you know, slot here. And obviously depending on what's in the control thing, you could say you have, you know, one, two, three, or four of these things. It, typically you'll just have one. And then after that comes the payload. So, so, so I saw in the FEC there were like the two and three were redundant. They were both three, but three, four, um, on the FEC. If you look on the signal field, so like it says, like it's two bits, and you got then the two and three values are basically the same thing. So there was room. So, but you're thinking that the next version would just have one bit that would say like basically say LDCP or Reed Solomon, and then the rate would be like two bits. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I don't know. I think that um, I'm going to kind of push towards, um, let, let's give an actual number for the rate instead of the, you know, kind of a, an encoded rate. You know, these are kind of enumerated by, you know, so th this, um, uh, this, the signal field here act, uses quite a bit of bandwidth. And um, so if we go, go back to the base, so it uses this entire column here, right? And if you, you look at um, the resource grid, uh, where, where is that? Uh, do you remember where, where that was? It was oh. under, um, no. Uh, resource grid construction. Okay, so maybe down here. So it, it basically uses this entire column, and and there, you know, if you expand this out, you know, there's 900 rows, 901 rows, 
And um, so two thirds of that, those are used up by reference fields and the rest of it is a signal field. So um, the, so, you know, certainly there's plenty more room to, to put this stuff in there. And uh, th those symbols, um, let's see here. I think in the control field, um, they're quam, but I, I can't remember if these, if the, um, if the um, symbols themselves in the signal field, if these are, are uh, a BPSK. So the, yeah, so I, I think the signal field is BPSK. So the, when we look at the, the basic layout, the signal field and control field, they're BPSK because um, you, you really need those to get through uh, to, to be able to decode these guys, depending on your SNR and signal quality. Um, you know, there, there's some feedback from, there's got to be some feedback from the receiver, you know, because it's a two-week link to tell, hey, my, my signal strength is this, you know, um, and then based on that, you, you, um, you can define what, what constellation pattern you, you want for the, you know, obviously for the, for the, um, for the higher throughputs, you're going to want, you know, like 64 quam or 16 quam. So if you're, you got super good receive characteristics and the transmitter knows it, he's going to probably encode this as 64 quam. Um, but to get that information in a low signal, you know, uh, condition, it, it needs to be transmitted as BPSK. So the, these guys are transmitted BPSK, depending on your signal quality, that's, that's, fed back from the receiver, um, it, then the transmitter will know to encode these, you, you know, as um, some higher order modulation, right? Anyways, okay, so um, that's kind of a finer detailed point. Um, I appreciate it, but yeah, okay. So I, I see, uh, yeah, there's uh, like you said, there's, ro there's room to add some more information if we wanted it. Yeah, so there would have to be a spec change. Um, and then this kind of what we're calling the signal field would need to be expanded. Um, and then um, and, and included. So the, the we didn't want to, you know, kind of overly complicate things right off the get go. Um, we just wanted to get um, something off the ground and demonstrate a waveform. So um, not a hundred percent sure if LDPC was a first thing, but, um, the, the guys kind of wanted to use it mainly because, um, the vector processor, DSP processor that, uh, Jonas and D David selected had, uh, LDPC encoders and decoders in them, you know, in hard form, you know, it's all done in a, in something that looks like a, you know, an embedded microprocessor, but it's really a, there's a DSP chip and it has, you know, it, it's made, it's made for LTE type communication, uh, you know, um, and there's an ARM process, you know, quad ARM processor that bolts onto this thing. So, um, and the encoder block for that DSP chip does have an LDPC encoder in it. The FPJs that we have right now don't, uh, don't, there is, I mean, AMD does have versions of the like RFSOC and some of these other things that do have LDPC, I believe, but um, anyways, okay, enough of that. So that's kind of. So, ba so basically like the, the, to circle back to where I was, why I was interested in this is just, so if I'm, if I'm impl implementing this on a Pluto, Probably the best step is just start with one channel, like one direction only. Don't try to duplex it. Just take like the receive and then maybe do the transmit and have them as different configurations. Yeah. So the, also the, I think, so if you see if we're, huh. um, I'm surprised that there's no, so one, one thing, 
that we probably need to um, uh, have included in the spec is a way to bypass FEC. So have a, you know, really like let's say zero would be um, no LDPC. So have okay. have a yeah. section that there's no LDPC. So the um, I mean, I, 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 my background right now, I'm, I'm working on a couple laser communication projects and they're using LDPC encoders too. And they, 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 um, well, one's using Reed Solomon and then the other one's using LDPC. The, in a, in the one that's using LDPC is it's following the SDA specification, which is publicly available SDA 3.1, whatever. Um, and in there, they, they do have an enumerated, okay, you use this, you know, they don't call it rate one half or whatever. It is it is like one half and two thirds or whatever, but uh, they they refer to it as a number of bits, encoded bits. So it, it um, kind of more or less reflects the encoded bit size of a frame. And one of the, you know, options on it is no LDPC. So if you have, you know, a perfect link and you don't need to do any for error correction at all, you can set it to zero. But um, it's nice to be able to do something like that because for development, it just uh, removes some of the complications of doing LDPC debug, you know? So um, I think that's a, a good idea. And um, certainly I, I'm gonna probably push for being able to, let's say bypass, any kind of Fourier correction, and then also have different Fourier correction mechanisms other than just LDPC. So that's okay. uh, versions of the spec. I need to, you know, coordinate that with Andreas and make sure he's he's okay with that. But that that's kind of my um, where I'm going to go with, with that stuff. Along with that, then we have to define more bits for encoded block size. So. Um, Personally, I don't, I don't see um, uh, I don't I don't see an issue with bits. I mean, right now we've got 16 bits for a number of transport blocks. I, personally, I don't think we need, need that many bits for transport blocks. But um, you know, we could certainly do a, let's say another 16 bits for encoded. 4K seems like a pretty big block. Yeah, no shit. Um, I mean, I'm just yeah. so uh, yeah. I, so I need to talk to him about this. This is probably um, so. The thing is, is do, does it really make sense to have this as a as a block? Um, and and I gotta read in the specification in there what, what he means by that. But if we go into the resource grid, um, a block could potentially be just one of these um, resource elements. Um, then that kind of makes more sense. But quite honestly, it, it, I personally would think that you would do columns instead of, you know, individual resource elements because, uh, you know, you're, you're, um, you're going to be T coding an entire column, not an individual element by element basis. So um, things like that. So I, I need to talk to him about those kind of things. Anyways. Um, so you also just, to backtrack the book that you mentioned of his of Schwarzinger's, so you recommend that is that a very good? I'm I'm I was looking at I just looked at it on uh, Amazon. It would you highly recommend it as something to look into as if you want to if you want to deep dive into this. Yeah, so if you're designing any kind of radio system from scratch, he really goes well into it, and um, you know I haven't read the entire book. You know he's got a second edition out. I would yeah certainly get a the paperback they're not very expensive and he really doesn't get very much money from it but um is so, the second edition worth the extra money would you say or the same, how, how different are they are they very different? um well if you get the second edition you don't need the first one it, they both um have the second edition has all the information from the first edition you know it's just he's He's added to it. He took the first edition and edited it and added to it. And the second edition is not quite double the thickness, but it's, you know, maybe an, another, let's say, 50% thicker or something like that. So it's a significant amount of new information. 
And uh, he does take everything from scratch and then develops it into a full blown, you know, like Wi-Fi examples and stuff like that. There's generally a lot of code, MATLAB code behind it and okay. included. Um, and I forgot what chapter, but I mean, the, the applicable chapters, you know, for this is really the, the OFDM chapter specifically with respect to LTE and WiMAX and Wi-Fi examples and implementation details. And I think that's like chapter nine. I can't remember exactly. Um, and they're probably different in each book, but um, so if you, if you know enough about RF design and the basics, you could probably skip some of the first stuff and then, um, and go directly to those chapters. And there's a lot of, um, he includes a lot of math and stuff associated with how to do it. I've heard <laughs> from him, <laughs> but I haven't verified this, but there is a chapter on, uh, designing LDPC encoder and decoder from scratch. So, um, and I believe there is MATLAB code for that. Um, and uh, I said, oh, really? Okay, so then uh, as part of what uh, the model, I believe we will deliver a Python module that doesn't just call a library, but will do LDPC from scratch, give you bits in and LDPC out, and it's all not done. There'll be code associated with everything that's done with that. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited about that because I don't know how to do it myself. Um, I, is somebody working on that or is that on the pull list? I, I believe that that's already done. He's got it. It's It hasn't been published yet. But it is, uh, I believe it's in the book. Uh, I haven't checked yet, but I mean, may maybe as a as an assignment for next week, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, look at that and then ping him on that too. Um, you know, I've kind of dominated the conversation here, Michelle. We've only got like five minutes left. Oh, well, I think it's all been uh, excellent stuff. Um, I think... Uh, that we're in we're in decent shape. We've got a lot of work cut out for us. This is a non-trivial uh, project with a lot of of what I would say kind of important uh, applications. Um, and because it's OFDM based, it's a it's a modern um, digital communications protocol. It has a tremendous potential to be uh, highly useful for for just educational and and for professional development preparation. You know, academic development self-improvement, all that sort of thing. So I'm just really super excited that we're, we're able to do this and, and we'll just keep at it. Um, we, I think we do need more, uh, human resources. We do need more, more people. Uh, we're at the point where we can start splitting up some of the work a little bit better than, than in the beginning when we just had the, the, the flux link spec. And it was just a question of, of familiarity with it and, and, and providing feedback and, and revisions. Um, you know, that was, that was a single track sort of thing, but we're, we're now in well into the, to the trying to implement things, learning the tools and, and solving some of the problems. Um, so we, there's a number of people that have expressed a lot of interest and, in, and in kind of, uh, are following along. Um, so what I'll do over the next week is to kind of reach out, make sure that they know about this meeting and that they're, everyone's welcome to come and ask questions. Um, and then we'll, We'll just keep moving forward. So I think we're we're in decent shape. We got a lot to do. All right, back so, to you. Oh, one one last question, what Michelle, really quick. Um, so like going in the remote labs is the best place to like really dig into this, right? For well, now, to start yeah. off, I'd say going into the remote labs, like getting you get a an account. Um, you know, walk through the process on the in the repo under working with FPGAs. You know, getting a lab account. And then learning how to use the the account that's there's a there is an account dedicated to MATLAB so that's the like the, the home account for for our MATLAB instance with all the toolboxes so that is one way to do it that would be the best way to do it if you're interested in helping get this on the air uh, with an FPGA path you don't have to have an account in order to contribute to the Python models and they're in the same Neptune repository so all of this work is published in the Neptune repository I'll make sure that it's a uh, it's clearly findable here in in the uh, in this uh, in this video. Um, 
So there's there's several ways to do it. But if you want to work on hardware and getting stuff working over the air, getting waveforms wiggling in the air, then yes, the remote labs is the right place to go. Uh, if you just want to contribute to the spec uh, or the Python uh, simulation, um, and essentially a co-simulation uh, sort of effort, then then you do not have to to go through and get an account on the VM or learn the <laughs> learn how to use the uh, the big station. So okay. both and. Okay. And and are all the tasks on the pull list in the for the for Neptune? Like are they listed in the pull list or is there another area where they're listed? Like what have people broken down like, hey, we'd like this done, this done, this Oh, uh yeah. I, Leonard started a Trello board uh for oh, okay. Neptune. And that is pinned. That board is pinned in the Neptune channel on our Slack. And so that's a that's a good place to find like summaries of work and like like uh you know it's Trello board so it's like Kanban style, uh, to do doing done. Um, so that's that's kind of the central location for, for the, kind of like the task list. Um, so so yeah. Cool. Okay, thanks. Um, just also if I um, just for Michelle, just, I had to switch my accounts because I can't use my UNLV or I figure my UNLV account is going to be oh. end of life. Right, because I'm not in UNLV, so I, I it still looks the same from outside, but it's a different email that I have access to. Okay, yeah, I'll get in touch with you to make sure that everything's working right. Okay. Awesome. Okay. All right, back to you, Leonard, for the close. Bring it home. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I I want to thank everybody uh, for for attending, and hopefully, uh, we get a uh, um, some. Uh, uh, good um uh, inertia going towards um towards getting you know on both fronts basically one is um exercising the fpga and and uh, um the 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 rf chip on it uh, associated with it and then also um getting a good understanding of the um model itself which kind of helps us uh, make uh, de decisions on you know what how things happen in in uh, uh, on the FPGA and in the real system. Um, so, anyways, I uh, think that this is great. Uh, thanks, Michelle, for setting this up. You're very welcome, and we will uh, we'll hold the this meetup uh, next week, and we'll talk about what we've done um, over this future uh, week. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And then if we have any plans for the future, we can talk about any roadblocks or any resources that we need. Um, so it should try to have a weekly meetup for Neptune. And um, we'll, we'll, I'll make sure that the word gets spread about that. Okay. Right, and just fun. FYI, I, I just asked, I just looked at the Trello board and I asked for, somebody's going to have to, I guess, approve me so I can see. I'll, I'll do so that. That's me, Ed. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Welcome aboard. All right, everybody, have a wonderful day. See you next week and see you on Slack. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, bye.